Threads GC in 64 bit. It basically just delegates some of the I.O. operations to Threads, but it should uh, provide a good performance improvement for very large repositories. Also, automatic garbage collection of symbols. Um, when you have a large database, symbols hang around forever, whether or not they're referenced. And um, we have databases where, for whatever reason, people thought it would be nice to do things like, you know, small engine one as symbol, which stays around forever. So it would be nice to have a way to clean those up because those uh, typically aren't needed uh, once the references to them are deleted. And another one is the committed login behavior. Um, when we have um, certain security mechanisms enabled in Gemstone S, we commit as a login to record the timestamp of, of the login for password aging and, and what have you. And that's all well and good, but if you have, say, several hundred headless agents all logging at the same time with the same user ID, um, it causes uh, latency of login. So we've done some things to alleviate that. Um, another major feature requested by a customer is backup and restore to and from NFS drives. Historically, Gemstone doesn't do NFS because um, back in the day, NFS was not reliable and there was a lot of uh, data loss off it. It's gotten a lot better over the years and uh, customers are now willing to uh, accept any, uh, any data loss over an NFS to backup and restore. So you still can't run your database on NFS drives, which would probably be a bad idea for a number of reasons, but there may be times where you want to restore a backup or a tram log or something off of an NFS drive out in some data warehouse someplace, and uh, we're now going to allow that. Uh, Gemstone 32 bit is coming to end of life as a product, and I want to emphasize I'm only saying 32 bit here. Uh, I don't want anybody running off saying Gemstone's end of life or mis, you know, getting the wrong idea. So Gemstone 32-bit, what does that really mean? What it really means is no more major new releases, no more product sales, and we're going to continue supporting existing customers for up to three more years to 2015, but we won't be accepting maintenance renewals beyond 2015 for Gemstone 32. So we're trying to give the remaining customers lots of leeway and runway to get over to Gemstone 64 if they want to stay on Gemstone. The vast majority of our customers have already done that, but there are a few notable exceptions that uh, have not been able to do it yet. <laughs> I won't name names. Okay, and now on to Gemstone 64 version 3. Uh, it, had, it has finally shipped. Uh, it was released to manufacturing on June 15th. Um, it's a major step forward in features and performance in uh, Gemstone Smalltalk. I'll go through some of the highlights of uh, the 3.0 release. Um, one big thing is native code in the virtual machine. So we're now back to compiling Smalltalk bytecodes over to native code at method invocation. Um, the speed improvement you get is variable. It depends how much Smalltalk you're running versus how much time you're running in primitives or what have you. But we're seeing anywhere from 25 to 100% speed improvement. What's 100% speed improvement? <laughs> Twice as fast. <laughs> oh, okay. 50%. Well, oh, however you want to do it. <laughs> I think you get the idea. Uh, forward function interface. You can now uh, call out to third party shared libraries or your own shared libraries. Uh, writing the code to do so entirely in small talk. Um, Martin presented this last year at ESA 2010 in Barcelona. So if you're really curious about this, you can uh, probably dig up his presentation somewhere. Uh, Mid-level shared page caches for large systems. This spreads the caching across uh, more nodes optionally. Um, if you want to go this way, it tends to come into play with very large systems. The classic gemstone architecture looks like this. It's kind of a star configuration. So you have a primary host with a stone, the database extent files, and the shared cache. And then you have a number of remote shared page caches. 
And from this diagram, you can imagine that if this was hundreds, you could bottleneck on the um, network interface on the stone host. Okay? And we have customers that have done this, even with a 10 gigabit Ethernet card. Okay, if you have five or six hundred of these machines all running hot, you can flatline the card. So to alleviate that, um, we've added the option of mid-level caches. What this really does is it gives the VMs, the gems, another place to look for pages before going all the way back to the, to the stone uh, main uh, server host. Okay, so the idea is that we'll find hopefully many of the pages in our local shared cache, many more in the intermediate shared cache, the ones in blue, and we won't have to go to the stone machine and pull pages across the network nearly as often. It also reduces the number of network connections um, to the stone machines substantially, as you can see from the diagram. So this is optional. It's, it's not uh, the only way to do remote shared caches, but uh, we have at least one customer using this now, and it's helping quite a bit. Also in uh, 3.0, we have uh, external password validation. So when you log into Gemstone, you no longer have to store the password encrypted in Gemstone. You can use an external authentication source to authenticate the login. Um, there's two ways to do that right now. Um, one is using LDAP. Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. If you've ever programmed it, you know lightweight is a term to be taken lightly. Um, it's not very lightweight. And uh, Unix Password Authentication, which um, abstracts to whatever mechanism you're using to do a, a Unix login to the server. And that can be redirected through Unix techniques to a number of uh, authentication means. Um, one of the major step forwards is multi-threading operations which operate on the entire object repository, uh, specifically garbage collection, um, object audit, things like listing instances. You know, if you want to find all instances of a class and you've got a, a Faro image, it's a trivial thing, but if, if you have, you know, a 500 gigabyte gemstone database, um, it takes a little more time, and especially when it was single threaded. So we've now multi-threaded all these operations listed now. Uh, so you can use as many threads uh, to run concurrently um, as you choose. Each thread is done down in the, uh, below the small top layer, down in C for speed, using native um, OS threads. The uh, aggressiveness of this can be dialed up and down on the fly. So you can say uh, how many threads you want to operate doing your scan, and the maximum percent of the total system uh, available CPU to take. So what it does is it looks at um, the total CPU usage on the box, realizing that this um, operation is probably going to take a lot of CPU, and it will try to keep the, uh, the CPU used on the machine less than the percentage you specify. So if you want to run it flat out to 100%, you can. Let's say uh, production starts during the day, you want to dial it down so that you don't uh, create uh, slow performance for users, you can go in and execute this method, turn it down to say 20%, and then dial it up again later. Uh, one note for existing Gemstone customers is the default methods um, for things like garbage collection, object audit, and so on are not aggressive. We didn't want to surprise anybody out of the box when they go and run their script that they've had forever and all of a sudden have it uh, redline the machine. So the default methods uh, are still there. They're not aggressive. There are aggressive methods there as examples. For instance, mark for collection and you have know, fast mark for collection. And those are only examples. You can set these parameters I mentioned back on this slide any way you want. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, these multi-thread operations are Transactional, in the sense that, uh, for example, if I do all references or something, that would be a transaction, a gemstone transaction? No, they will, um, most of them will shift their views and abort forward as required if they get a single board. Okay, so they, they, they operate in a transaction, but the transaction can be aborted as needed um, when told to by the stone. So they, these operations do not hold a commit record. 
or a view of the database for the entire duration. Um, that, that was actually one of the hard things to make this work right. Is if you if you hold the same view, this is this code becomes a lot simpler, but it's not practical because you know you don't want to run a, a list of instances that takes ten hours and hold a view ten hours old on the database because it tends to grow huge and performance dies. So. But, but, but it's still it's kind of a virtual view, right? Like, because this is kind of, it's still evolving when you are performing this kind of do you right. Need to see the new changes or, or not? Well, it may or may not. I mean, okay. if you're doing like a list of instances, the only instances you're guaranteed to find are the ones in the view you started with. Right. Okay. You may or may not detect okay. new ones. Okay. Okay. So it's independent. It's independent, but it shifts its view forward. But the view that you um, that it sees when it looks for the instances or the garbage or whatever have you is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to find the new changes in those new views. It may or may not. Yeah. Uh, prof monitor has been improved. The resolution has been dialed down to um, one microsecond. It was previously one millisecond, which on modern hardware missed a lot of events. And this class was pretty much rewritten from the ground up. Um, it gives uh, visual work style um, profiles now of, uh, of methods when we run call stacks. Um, something right out of the box now is built-in Monticello support. Um, previously, you had to, when you wanted to start loading um, packages um, into Gemstone, the first trick was to get Monticello to load, and that could be an ordeal in itself. What we decided to do for 64 version 3 is actually include Monticello in the base image. Um, there are customers that uh, don't use Monticello, that will never need this, but for anybody that does, now at least now you have a place to start and you can start loading packages um, from a virgin uh, base image. How do you decide what the latest version is? How do you decide what the latest version of what is? Uh, the second example. It's the... Um, how many it uses the built for stuff, I think. So I would just use the version of it? Yeah. And if there are two? Pardon? If there are two, if there's two. the same version on it? Then that wasn't a good idea to use the use latest, was it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the use latest was the, the, the utility method, really. That was used, you know, just like it is everywhere else for developers who are doing this. And, you know, if it works, it works. If, if you want to be sure what you're doing, don't use that one. You know, I mean, I put that in. That was not my first idea to put that in for, your, for exactly your reason. You know, but it's awfully convenient, which is why, which is why a lot of people do use it. Thanks, Dale. Um, so, Gene, now this section talks about some differences in the Gemstone small talk um, going from version 2 to version 3. Uh, one major change is the runtime constructor for array literals has changed from the pound square bracket to the curly bracket and dot, which I believe is uh, more compatible with other small talks. The compile time constructor, the pound uh, round bracket, is unchanged. So no change there. Um, obviously, this can cause difficulties when filing in code used with previous versions of Gemstone. You can temporarily make uh, gemstone tolerate the old syntax with this little piece of small talk code um, shown on the slide. That's designed mainly to be used when you're um, testing an upgrade or trying to for the first time or two to get your gemstone small talk code from version 2x over to version 3. So it's a bridge, it's not intended to be used long term. The, um, the pound square bracket syntax has been repurpose to become byte array literals. An example on the bottom there. Before that, uh, there was no way to do a byte array literal in Gemstone. Um, exception handling has been extensively rewritten and cleaned up to use ex ANSI exceptions, uh, fully supported from the VM all the way up. This was a fairly major effort. Uh, ANSI exceptions, of course, are class-based. The old gemstone exception framework is there. It still works in some cases, but it's deprecated and broken in other cases. So, 
Uh, we're encouraging everybody that is uh, writing exception codes and small talk in Gemstone version 3 to use the ANSI version of it, which should be more familiar anyway. Uh, a number of new special selectors. These get inlined by the compiler at compile time, so they don't incur a message send, <coughs> which means practically if you're running small talk, they're very fast. Um, there was already a list of these previously um, in, in older versions of Gemstone. But these ones on this list have been added in version 3. Personally, it's very nice to have if nil and if not nil around. I use that quite a bit. Uh, are those, is that something that can be switched off? No. Um, not, not sure why you'd want to. Oh, you mean overloaded? No, and that's the downside of, of making the, uh, things like this um, inline by the compiler. I mean, the upside is it can be a lot faster. The downside is you can't overload it. And it, it's, we, we've heard kind of both sides of this argument. I mean, for forever we had um, we had we had uh, selectors that uh, were over were inlined in other small talks and not gemstone and like uh, and, and bracket and or for example <clears throat> previously and and or could be overloaded but if you wanted the fast version in critical code you had to use underbar and or underbar or and that drove some people crazy so we finally just said fine you know we don't expect you to overload and and or and we just made them inline of course that drove other people crazy. <laughs> so, you can't win. Uh, the class segment has been renamed to Gemstone Object Security Policy. This is probably the poorest named object in Gemstone. Um, so, we wanted to do that for a long time. 3.0, we just bit the bullet and did it. Um, Gemstone 64 has dynamic inst bars. So you can add inspires to an instance. Um, this replaces the object tags we used to have in um, Gemstone version 2 and, and prior. So you can do this without any instance migration and so on, but it's only on a per instance basis. Uh, large integer has been rewritten. Instead of uh, large positive integer and large negative integer, we just have one class now, large integer. Uh, storage format is different. If you're looking at the internals at all, it's stored in um, native order. And the, um, the, the, the basis for the, the, um, for the integer is also different internally. Most people won't be affected by this. Scale decimal changes. Um, scale decimal now has a literal notation with, with an S, so you can specify the mantissa and the scale. This is now ANSI compliant, but it didn't used to be. And in, in version 2x scale decimal, the, the 2x scale decimal is now a fixed point in 3.0. So we had some people that liked their scale decimal implementation better than the ANSI one, the other people that really didn't like it, so now you can do whichever one you prefer. Choose scale decimal or fixed point. And the literals are different. It's P for fixed point and S for scale decimal. Uh, the class hierarchy for the behavior classes has changed to 0. This was mainly to accommodate um, some things we did with Maglev and Ruby. Shouldn't affect most people, but if you rely on the inheritance structure of class and meta class, then, then you will need to pay attention to this. Um, <coughs> Classes migrated from version 2 will continue to have a class of meta class. And the newly created classes in 3.0 have a meta class of something called meta class 3. This was the easiest way to do what we needed to do. And it's, like I said, it should be transparent to most applications, most people. Um, so performance improvements now. The number of round trips from a, a jammer VM to the stone to do an abort. 
transaction has been reduced from two to one. Um, getting down the nuts and bolts here a little bit now. Um, the SMC queue is, is a, a, queue, a memory queue used by the VMs, the gems, to talk to the stone process. And in the old scheme of things, there was a lock that uh, protected that queue. So to talk to the stone, you had to get the lock, add yourself to the queue, and then release the lock. And if somebody else wanted to do the same thing at the same time, you had to wait. Now, the lock was written in assembler, so it was quite fast, but it's still serialized in the day. In uh, version 3, we totally rewrote that um, to use atomic operations um, down at the assembler level so that uh, there is no serialization of sessions wanting to talk to the stone. All they simply do is they atomically or a bit that's uh, dedicated for that session, and then they wait for the stone's response. There's no blocking. So the throughput of messages to the stone picks up quite a bit, this change on very busy systems. How do you atomically or a bit without blocking? Well, the blocking may be done, but it's done by the chip. I mean, all we do is, is call you know, the atomic or instruction. Okay. And we may have to retry it if it's changed, but it's there's not a blocking, per right. se. We don't have to wait. You know. So the blocking's at a lower level? Well, I'm not even sure if it really blocks. It, you know, it depends how they implemented the atomic instructions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the atomic instruction may have to block, right. but it's done way down, of course, at, at the chip level. Okay. There's no blocking at all up in user space now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the one thing that we lose with this design change is the order in which sessions ask the stone for service. Okay, so with the queue, of course it was a queue, and we, we knew it was first in, first out, like a queue. Um, with the uh, with the with the bits, we don't have that order. All we know is is which sessions are asking for service at any given time. So to work around that, and it's not an issue in most cases, but for some cases, um, you can now assign a priority to a session. Okay, and we have a few customers that are going to care about this, and it's kind of nice to have anyway, because they may have certain sessions that they want always to get the highest priority, and they may have other sessions where they don't, similar to, you know, nicing a process in, in Linux. Um, most people won't care about this, but if you do, you can change the session priority of your session so it gets serviced by the stone first, um, of course, the session holding or about to receive the commit token, which is the session doing the commit, which is a critical serialized region, always has the highest priority, regardless of its session priority set. Okay, another low-level change is the shared cache hash table relocks. Um, in the shared cache, you can think of the hash table is basically just a big dictionary where the key is the page ID and the value is the location of the page in the cache. Okay, so just think of a big key value dictionary. And the way it used to work is for a lookup on a given row, again, the lookup would have to be serialized. So only one session at a given time can do a lookup or a modification on a given row in the dictionary. Okay, so if you have three gems, say, that want to look up a page in the same row, the first one will do it, gem one in this diagram, and the other two will have to wait their turn to get the lock to go and do it. So again, you have latency built in by the serialization. Okay. Turns out you really don't need to do this for read-only operations that are lookups. And the vast majority of accesses to the hash table are read-only. If you have to modify the chain and add or remove a page, of course that has to be serialized because no one else can touch it while you're doing that. But for just lookups, there's no reason that can't happen concurrently. So this is what we did in version 3. Um, lookups can now be done concurrently so that in this example, gems 1 through 3 can search the, the, the row 14 of the dictionary and the collision chain at the same time. There's no serialization. 
again, this gives uh, fairly a good improvement in, in uh, throughput in, in busy systems on shared cache. Um, another thing we did is we got rid of all the um, OS calls to, <coughs> excuse me, AIO write, the async IO calls, which we used to use to write to uh, the train logs. Um, we just had too many different operating system bugs across different OSs over the years uh, in the way it's async IO has been implemented. So we threw all that out and we rewrote our own based on um, C C++ threads to do it. And it actually seems to perform as good or better than async IO did anyway. Um, you can control how many threads the stone allocates to do uh, Asynchronous writes with, with this parameter in the configuration file. Okay, a few stats. Um, this is a, a, a test of commit throughput comparing Gemstone 3.0 to Gemstone version 2. Um, it's done on a Slares 10 Spark machine with the Tranlos on solid state disks in order to uh, take the randomness of the I/O writes out of the equation. Um, the extents on raw devices with 16 sessions, basically doing very short transactions and just committing as fast as they possibly can. And you see we've got quite a, a decent improvement here from around 15, 1600 commits a second in version 2 up to nearly 8,000 commits a second in version 3. And that's due, I think, mainly to the, the two optimizations I just walked you through, plus the new um, native threads for uh, doing the train log writes. So we're quite happy with this. Another measurement we did um, was of the VM speed. <clears throat> and a good operation for testing this is building and, and working on large indexed collections, collections with one or more indices on various instance variables. And this also shows you kind of how your monitors will vary based on how much improvement you get. Uh, you can see the remove indexes um, is a little faster in 3.0, but not hugely. But the build indexes code down to the bottom, and the audit indexes is actually shows the biggest improvement. It's quite a bit faster in 3.0. And this is mainly due to the native code now in the VM, because it turns out the audit index code is almost entirely in small talk. There's very few calls to primitives. The remove indexes and the build indexes have more calls to primitives, and of course, the, the speed of primitive executing hasn't improved very much, but the speed of running the Smalltalk VM has improved quite a bit. Okay, that's uh, the end of version 3.0, summary of features. Things we're looking at for 3.1, our next major release, is uh, hot standby support. We ask about this a lot with customers that are used to dealing with things like Oracle and their, their cluster database solution, where you can just run any number of uh, hot standby databases on servers, um, perhaps even across the internet or across a window, and everything just stays in sync for you. And if one goes down, you can just fail over to another one. So we're looking at doing this um, as efficiently as possible in 3.1. So you'll be able to have uh, a master database and, and one or more uh, hot standby databases that the system will just automatically keep in sync for you right down to the boundary of a single transaction. So the way you do that today is you have to copy tran logs and then you may be you know, 10 or 15 minutes out from where you copy depending on the age of the tran log. So today we have what we call a warm standby. It's not, it's not uh, completely in sync, like this will be. Another thing that might interest you guys a little more is nested transactions. Um, you'll be able to abort some but not all changes made to persistent objects. So you'll be able to do multiple begins <laughs> transactions and abort part of the way out if you want to back out some of your changes that you made to objects but not all the changes. So this should be uh, particularly useful to, I think, glass and, and some of the glass applications have been written. And we're also going to uh, update our security framework even further. Um, SOX, the new features to support SOX requirements, SOX is Sarbanes-Oxley, the big uh, uh, 
uh, Reform Act uh, passed in the states a few years ago for record keeping and access to critical systems and, and so on. Um, we satisfy some of the requirements that people need for SOCs, but not all. So we're still specking that out. Uh, time frame for 3.1 is pro approximately a year from now. Probably sometime next summer is what we're looking at. And that's all I have. Is there any questions? Georg. I have actually two questions. One is... Uh, Hang on, do we, we have a microphone runner? Someone with a red hat, I believe, with strong legs. It's you, Bruce. <laughs> 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 so, I have actually two questions. Number one is, are, as your company has different products, and Looking back to history, it could be seen that components implemented for Gemstone S in the old days were at least spirits of the idea of Genfire and other products. And uh, is this now the other way around that components of work which you just described for 3 are coming from other parts of uh, your product family? And the second question is, is unrelated to this, is there any progress in the um, Gem Builder for small pouch products? Okay. Um, 3.0 was really started uh, in the design stage before the merger of VMware, so I have to say probably no to that one. Um, Gemfire was there. Gemfire was there, and Gemfire originally, for those that don't know, Gemfire is the uh, data caching solution. Uh, mainly for, for Java, that uh, the other side of Gemstone, the other side of engineering, uh, maintains. Um, that was started kind of as, with, with Gemstone Smalltalk as the paradigm, but it has evolved and diverged quite a bit since then, in terms of what those guys do. Um, so it started out with a, you know, using a shared page cache across nodes and all that stuff, but they've since gone away from that and they don't even have a shared page cache option anymore with uh, Gemfire. They just have multiple VMs across maybe hundreds of machines that keep various data structures in sync in the namespace very rapidly. That's pretty much in a nutshell what it does. So it doesn't look like uh, Gemstone has, and it's got, it, it has a, several things that it's missing from what Gemstone has does. It doesn't have persistence by reachability. It's basically just a big key value namespace and you put things in there. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the things that Gemstone has. Like I said, it doesn't have transactions. Okay, It's not a transactional system. You put it in there and it's in there. There's no rollback or anything like that. It's a bit of a different animal. Uh, I forget what your second question was, Gail. GBS. Um, yeah, GBS work is, is ongoing. Um, I didn't bring a roadmap for that, but Martin is up next. Martin is uh, my lead engineer on GBS, so um, if there's time, he can perhaps comment on that and kind of what those guys are working on. Um, I will say, normally it just keeps us busy keeping up with the various Syncom releases that come out. And because and, and, we plug into VisualWorks which is our, our biggest client base for GBS at a very low level. So whenever anything changes in VisualWorks, it, it usually breaks our stuff. And we have to scramble around and try to fix it and make it work again. So. Yeah. 